International Rates and Head of the Legal Studies Department, and I'm going to be the Master of Ceremonies for tonight's ninth annual Marek Novitsky Memorial Lecture. Uh, the lecture series, as you all know, is in the memory of Marek Novitsky, a Polish human rights defender. And in the tradition of the lecture series, uh, I would like to first ask Professor Viktor Szczepinski to tell us about Marek Novitsky, about his life, his achievements, to put the whole idea behind the lecture series into perspective for, for all of us. <coughs> yes, I'm Viktor Oshatinsky, and good evening. And I will talk about afterlife of Marek Novitsky mostly. Marek Novitsky was a physicist, a very good physicist. He got a scholarship in the 1960s that took him to Dubna, to the foremost the best center for the nuclear physicist of communist bloc in Russia. And towards the end of the year in Dubna, he was already extremely sensitive to human rights and individual rights. As most of the Soviet human rights activists, he was Polish, but he was there as a guest, but Soviet human rights activists became English. Sakharov, Rukovalyev, others were basically in pure sciences, physics, and uh, natural sciences. And they had everything. They had wonderful life conditions. They could use the uh, shops, shops behind, behind, behind the yellow curtains, special shops. They had good salaries, but they had very limited freedom of movement, freedom of communication, freedom of speech because of the nature of their work. But the nature of their work needed freedom of expression and freedom of reading and freedom of communication. And living in this paradise in Vietnam, they all sooner or later realized how important these things are. So Mike, the physicist, got back to Poland and forgot and forsaken the physics and became a human rights activist. During the Solidarity period, 1980-81, he was the chairman of the Commission of the Complaints at the Warsaw Region of Solidarity. That was a commission to which complaints for the various violations by the government, police, and other forces, and government in general would come. And then he was very active with the Helsinki Committee in Poland. And after the negotiated peaceful transition in Poland in 1989-1990, Actually, uh, there were three of us, Marek Nowitzki, physicist, Marek Nowitzki, the lawyer, and myself, who met in the house of late Lech Valandes, who was the advisor for legal cases of the president of Poland later on, and we thought about how to do, what to do with the Helsinki Committee of Human Rights on. And we decided to establish the Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights that would do primarily human rights education. Marek Nowitzki, who was the lawyer, went into the legal part of that and also in, in the international human rights movement. I was somehow asked to raise money for this, which I actually found first $100,000 in Canada. And then Marek Nowitzki was doing the job. It was incredible, it was extremely effective, and very vocal, and he loved educating and training professionals in non-legal professions like teachers, uh, police, and uh, other groups about human rights. It was very effective, and then three, four years later, with the support of Human Rights Governance Grant Program at Open Society Institute, with the Ford Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation, we together got a big package in which the program of education in human rights in Central Asia and Caucasus was formed. Marek spoke excellent Russian, and he loved that, and he was loved. At his funeral, there were about 50 people from Central Russia and Caucasus crying. 
<laughs> and died prematurely in the age of 54 in 2003. But what he did actually, and the people he worked with, so Polish Helsinki, that they created, they educated, and they created a number of the human rights, small human rights organizations in Central Asia and Caucasus. And uh, that was first the uh, normal training, then the more sophisticated training of skills of human rights. And all along he was coming to me because he knew that I may have some still do fundraising, he said. No, there is a problem that these organizations that we founded, they are very active, they want their volunteers, they give their heart to that. But they need, you know, two, three, five thousand dollars to enable them to act. And no one is going to give them because it's too small money. <coughs> For everyone to give, you know, half a million, hundred thousand, a quarter of a million, that makes sense. But it's too much paperwork to give to someone three, two thousand dollars, you know, grant. But that's all they need, and they because they, they put their lives, they put their freedom, their liberty at stake, but they don't know how to do that. So I started banging here and there, and I was also failed. I mean, it was unsuccessful. So when Marek died, Arian Ayer, myself, Emily Martinez, we decided to commemorate him with at the Air Fund with creating the fund for small grants in South Central Asia and Caucasus that are Marek Novitsky grants. The grants are named by Marek Novitsky for his purpose. But then also we decided between CU, OSI, and the Helsinki Foundation in Warsaw to have the lecture series that the very outspoken for the most distinguished human rights activists from legal profession and other professions will speak, will have a lecture, one lecture in Central European University in Budapest, and one at the Warsaw University under the auspices of the Helsinki Foundation. The first speaker was, was Arthur Chaskalson, who was the, the, the chairman of the Supreme Court, which is at the same time constitutional court in South Africa. And we had a legal and moral philosopher, Jan Elster. We had a number of the uh, judges like Yehuda Barak, we had uh, the scholar the Professor Meron, we had among others uh, Robert Padanter, who actually did away with the death penalty in France and Europe. Last year it was Eva Lentowska from Poland, first ombudsman and then the judge of the Constitutional Court. And this time is the last Marek Nowitzki lecture in the series, so we are honored to have Lord Lester of Herner Hill to deliver Marek Nowitzki lecture. Thank you for your attention. So when you listen to the names of previous year's lecturers, uh, I'm sure that you recognized the names of the leaders of the human rights movement. People who broke momentum and most important changes. Uh, the way we know human rights today is due to their professional and personal contributions, their commitment and their perseverance. These are people who don't and did not give up easily. But when you listen to the lectures, and some of them are actually uh, available on, on video on the website, and when you listen to their stories, you, you actually realize that these people are great troublemakers. They're, they made an entire life out of making governments uncomfortable, confronting them about their weaknesses, confronting them about omissions, injustices, and reminding the political elites about the limits of the powers which were vested in them. Today's speaker is also a true troublemaker in the sense in which I just described. He knows more than one career in the legal profession, so let's just list it. For a while he was a judge. He currently is a very active barrister in Blackstone Chambers. He is a legislator in the House of Lords. Uh, he is a member, a very proud member of the Joint Committee of Human Rights. He is an architect of the Human Rights Act in the UK. And <coughs> speaking of perseverance, this whole idea of the Human Rights Act was actually an idea which occurred to Lord Lester in 1968 when he gave a Fabian lecture requesting the incorporation of the European Convention into the legal system of the UK. 
Um, he is a very well known defender of freedom of expression and uh, an ardent campaigner against blasphemy legislation. If you type his name into Google, uh, the most recent entries will be about his criticism of the Royal Charter in the UK, and there will be lots and lots of pieces in the US about the person from overseas who dared to criticize the First Amendment. As a minor detail in, in his career, he also introduced the Civil Partnership Bill, and we like to forget it that actually it took a private member's bill to start the avalanche which ended up in legalizing same-sex marriage in the UK. He happens to be the president of Interrights, and he is an extremely eminent author on constitutional and human rights topics. But I have to say that this is not why we have him here tonight. <laughs> we actually have him here tonight for something I didn't even mention. And that story, if I understand it correctly, started in 1968 when the Commonwealth Immigrants Act was passed. This was an act uh, which managed to cut roughly 200,000 persons from their families, those East Asian, these, those East African Asians who all of a sudden were banned from visiting their family members, typically husbands, uh, who were legally, legally residing in the UK. Uh, Lord Lester was instrumental to bringing the case of the East African Asians to the then European Commission of Human Rights. Uh, and they actually won with a very unusual argument. Under Article 3 of the Convention, which prohibits degrading treatment, they argued that singling out a group of persons for differential treatment on the basis of race was a bad idea. Now, the Commission agreed with them, and the Commission actually said that discrimination on the basis of race constitutes a special form of affront to human dignity. End of quote. The Commission's uh, words were then uh, listened to by, by the government in the UK, and this is how you get, after a long wrangling, of course, to the Race Relations Act of 1976, and all of a sudden, the torture case starts sounding very much like an anti-discrimination case. And today we are here because Lord Lester very kindly agreed to speak about his career in tackling race discrimination in the UK and in Europe. And I will leave it here and let Lord Lester tell the story of his life as he lived it and as he made and think or at least challenging race discrimination happening in Europe. So I give you the Thank you very much, Renata. I, I did warn you before that if you were too long and too effusive in your introduction to me, uh, I would have to make some fun at your expense. Uh, and you have fallen into that trap. And therefore I can recall what happened when Dan Shaw, you know, the famous American uh, columnist, among other things, when Dan Shaw and I were given an honor in uh, University of Harvard by the uh, American Academy of Arts and Science. And somebody gave an introduction to him a bit like what you had just done uh, for me. And Dan then said the following, and I like to think that it is true. He said that when Dr. Kissinger received the Nobel Peace Prize, an American lady came up to him afterwards and she said, Dr. Kissinger, I won't do the American accent, my wife said, <laughs> I know that. She said, Dr. Kissinger, Dr. Kissinger, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of the whole of humankind. <laughs> and he replied, you're welcome. <laughs> Now, uh, I um, feel very sorry for all of you because my wife tells me that I'm even more boring when I read than when I speak, and I have to read tonight because there's going to be a book and because I'm in the presence of 
a lot of very gifted people, uh, and I have to dress this up as something worth publishing. <laughs> and in the House, of, in the House of Lords, uh, we have a couple of extremely good rules. One of which is, if you are too long, people yell too long. <laughs> and, and if we read too much, they yell reading. So if I go on for more than three hours this evening, <laughs> you may both yell too long and both yell reading if your director has not done so already. I'm delighted to give this lecture in honor of Marek Novici. And as you've heard from Victor, he really was a shining beacon of liberty and uh, under law, whose work for human rights in Europe's new democracies is an inspiration. I'm greatly honored to have been, have been asked to join the previous lecturers in this series, each of whom has been a beacon of liberty I doubt whether I'm of equal worth, but I'll do my best to explain my role as troublemaker. And I should say, uh, in view of the fact that your director has already said I'm a troublemaker, but I am also psychically unemployable. And if you want to work in human rights, you probably need to be psychically unemployable. <laughs> The Central European University and the Helsinki Fund, uh, Foundation for Human Rights in Poland, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, have asked me to discuss effective and practical ways of tackling race discrimination. And I do so as a practitioner, not a scholar, a practitioner with a half century of experience as campaigner, advocate, and lawmaker. I have ancestral ties with Hungary. Uh, my natural father, whom I scarcely knew, was a Hungarian Jew from a small town near the Austrian border. Uh, most members of his family were murdered in Auschwitz. My other connection comes from having chaired the European Women's Rights Center for three years from 1999 until 2001. Uh, that brought me frequently to this fascinating city. The center and the Central European University of everything to the general support of George Soros, a great philanthropist and public philosopher of Hungarian Jewish origin, deeply committed to tackling racial injustice and persecution against the Roma and other vulnerable minorities. The subject of my lecture raises sensitive issues of public policy, especially under current political and social conditions that challenge the governors of Hungary to demonstrate that Hungary deserves its place within the European family now, as it did after the Velvet Revolution of 1989 against Soviet oppression. In 1989, the people of Hungary accomplished what brave Hungarian freedom fighters were unable to do in 1956 when Soviet tanks occupied Budapest. I well remember the optimism of those early years of freedom from Soviet rule and the leadership given by Laszlo Solyom as president of the Constitutional Court in upholding the rule of law and human rights. I also pay tribute to Andras Shayo, Professor of Law at this university, Judge of the European Court of Human Rights, who has greatly influenced its jurisprudence, especially on free expression. Uh, the subject of my talk is politically sensitive. Neo-Nazi sentiments were on the rise, here and elsewhere in Europe. The European Commission has expressed great concern over the rise of anti-Semitic incidents across the EU. Uh, Anti-Semitism in Hungary is especially shocking uh, to those who remember the country's tragic history. In the 1940s, Hungary's Jewish community was one of the largest in Europe. More than half a million Hungarian Jews were murdered in the Holocaust after Hungarian Nazis, not German Nazis, Hungarian Nazis, took over in October 1944. Today, the Hungarian Jewish population 
is less than a fifth what it was before the war, about 100,000. But that has not meant the elimination of Hungarian anti-Semitism. The far-right Jobbik party is currently the third largest in the country and has staged, staged massive anti-Semitic rallies in the streets of the, your cities. According to an article uh, published in the New York Times uh, at the end of the last month, one Jobbik party official has called for a list of all Jewish legislators to assess their loyalty. It would be interesting to apply that to me and the many other Jews in the House of Lords. Uh, Anne Applebaum's article in the current New Yorker is also especially illuminating. She reports that a poll last year showed that 63% of Hungarians feel hostile towards Jews, and that is up from 47% in 2009. And on the 8th of uh, November last week, on the eve of the 75th anniversary of Kristallnacht, the night of the breaking of mirrors, of glass, the brutal Nazi pogrom against Jews, their businesses, their homes, and their places of worship, the Fundamental Rights Agency published the findings of its survey of Jewish people's experiences and perceptions of hate crimes, anti-Semitism, and discrimination in the EU. The survey found that Hungary and France are the most hostile countries towards Jews in Europe. Most of the serious anti-Semitic incidents in France being committed by Islamic extremists. In Britain, 9% of respondents to a survey said that they had often heard the statement, Jews are responsible for the current economic crisis. But this figure rose to 59% in Hungary. The highest level of anti-Jewish insults and attacks on Jewish buildings were reported in France. Attacks on Jewishness in the media and desecration of cemeteries were the highest in Hungary. Three quarters of Jewish people feel that anti-Semitism has worsened in the past five years. A third of European Jews have considered emigrating because of fears of rising uh, anti-Semitism. Far-right political parties in France and Austria have gained force. Uh, anti-Semitism is a light sleeper, and once awakened, it is terribly hard to put back to sleep. We need brave and wise leadership across Europe to combat the rising tide of racism against Jews and the Roma and ethnic minority Muslims. Now my lecture is about the use of law to combat racial discrimination effectively. But law is no panacea and must be accompanied by the necessary political will to make it work in practice. In Animal Farm, George Orwell's satirical fairy tale published in 1945, attacking Stalin and totalitarian rule, Napoleon's Committee of Pigs replaced the seven commandments with a single phrase. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. The pigs' cynicism should warn us but fine declarations and laws commanding equality are meaningless unless they are translated into political reality. The world is full of covenants, conventions, charters, and constitutions protecting the fundamental right to equality without discrimination. But they mean little unless there is a political and social culture of support. The Soviet Constitution contained the full panoply of human rights, but it was a mockery because there was no free speech or rule of law and the interests of the state were paramount. The philosophy underpinning the right to equality is easy to state and difficult to apply. All human beings share a common humanity. No one is more equal than others. 
the principle of equal treatment requires that everyone is treated on the basis of their individual merit, not on the basis of broad assumptions and stereotypes. For example, that women are unable to do jobs requiring physical strength, or that black people are intellectually inferior, or that Muslims are jihadist terrorists. It is all too easy to act on the basis of stereotypes, often combining more than one kind of discrimination, as with discrimination against black women, but involves mixed stereotyping about race and gender, or against Jews or Muslims because of religion and race. The problems of ethnic profiling and the discriminatory use of police powers to stop and search are widespread Europe. In the British Equality Act 2010, in which I played quite a large part, we brought together all the different grounds of forbidden discrimination, and we made unlawful, direct and indirect discrimination because of race, religion, belief, lack of belief, sexuality, disability, age, and transgender. And we introduced public sector duties, now relying more on monitoring and positive measures to promote equality. We permit positive action if it's proportionate. But much remains to be done in Britain to tackle entrenched discriminatory practices, not least within parts of our police service. Our two countries, the UK and Hungary, are bound by the EU race directive, the design of which owes much to British experience <coughs> in using civil rather than criminal law to tackle direct and indirect discrimination, harassment, and victimization. By the way, I'm going to warn you all that if you go to sleep, I'm going to ask a lot of questions afterwards if you don't <laughs> ask any questions. So you better pay attention to what follows because I should be questioning all of your American time. <laughs> I was involved in fashioning our civil law as a special advisor to Roy Jenkins. Uh, I don't think that the director put that into her introduction in the way. Disgraceful. Uh, and uh, we were fashioning the law in the mid 1970s. And the minister gave me responsibility for fashioning the legislation against race and sex discrimination. And we made a number of strategic decisions that I think remain relevant 40 years later. First, criminal law is not well designed to combat discrimination. It seeks to punish rather than to provide remedies to the victim. The criminal standard of proof beyond reasonable doubt is too strict. The prosecutorial process involving trial by jury in England and the involvement of the police are not appropriate. So we decided to make discrimination a civil wrong to be decided by the civil courts. Secondly, individual com complainants need the support of a well-funded professional <coughs> equality agency that supports test cases and has investigative, monitoring, and enforcement powers to tackle systemic discriminatory practices and provide equal opportunity and treatment through positive measures. Our present statutory Equality and Human Rights Commission has that very difficult role. So you need a, a, an administrative agency to back it up. Thirdly, the concept of unlawful discrimination must include not only intentional or direct discrimination, as where A treats B less favorably than C deliberately on racial grounds, but also unintentional and indirect discrimination, as where A applies a requirement or rule to everyone of B's ethnic group, and the requirement is equal in a formal sense, but has an unequal adverse impact on members of that ethnic group and can't be shown to be objectively justified. For example, where there's a minimum height requirement to be a police officer 
or a fire officer, or a language required to be a worker in a factory. If it hits disproportionately as a particular ethnic group, it is unlawful to indirect discrimination unless it can be shown to be objectively justifiable. This concept is known in the United States as disparate impact discrimination. And Chief Justice Berger, writing for the American Supreme Court before it was reduced <coughs> to its current level, Chief Justice Berger uh, uh, referred to Aesop's fabled offer of milk to the stork to try to explain what the court was deciding. The, the, the fox in Aesop's fable invites the stork to eat with him and provides soup in a bowl which the fox can lap up easily but the stork cannot drink with its beak. So the stork then invites the fox back again to a meal served in a narrow neck pitcher. It's easy for the stork and impossible for the fox. And in the case of Griggs and the Power Company, Chief Justice Berger explained that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prescribes not only overt discrimination, but practices that are fair in form, but discriminatory in operation. The touchstone, he said, is business necessity. Well, we included indirect discrimination, as well as direct discrimination, in the British legislation. Uh, one is giving effect to the concept of indirect discrimination, is how the claimant can prove that an apparently neutral rule or practice or procedure hits disproportionately as an ethnic group to which he belongs. And that is one area where the gathering and use of statistics is so important to make anti-discrimination measures work in practice. It's virtually impossible to rely on the concept of indirect race or sex discrimination if you have no ethnic or gender-based statistics. And the statistics need to be gathered in a way that respects personal privacy, especially where intimate personal information about someone's religious beliefs or their sexuality. Issues of privacy do not arise, though, in collecting data about people's uh, ethnicity or gender, provided it's used to combat race and sex discrimination and provided that there are effective safeguards against abuse. I say that particularly with Hungary in mind because there's still a great problem, I believe, about that here. Public authorities can't monitor practices to ensure that they're non-discriminatory unless they have access to reliable data about the effect of those practices on ethnic minorities. Uh, and I quote in my talk, no need to do it now, from the Belgian linguistic case as long ago as 1968, to that effect. Now, Europe's Roma are among the worst victims of racial discrimination. Everywhere, they're subjected to police and gang brutality, and to discrimination in housing and education and employment and public services. That is what I learned when I chaired the European Roma Rights Centre in Budapest. And I'll return to the disturbing situation in Hungary a bit later. But first of all, I want to tell you a bit about some British cases in which I was involved. Because of anti Roma hostility in Eastern Europe, including Romania, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic, there was an influx of Roma into the UK, many seeking asylum. And so, to calm public hostility, British immigration officers were stationed at Prague Airport seeking to prevent the Roma from boarding aircraft bound for London to claim refugee status. How, how many of you knew that? Uh, this afternoon, when I went to the Open Society Archive, I was shown a remarkable film, a contemporary film, of how in 1939, in July 1939, hundreds of Jews boarded a boat from
from hard down the Danube, seeking to escape from the Nazis and Dachau and try to reach Palestine. And the film showed exactly what happened to them. And for me, one of the most disgraceful things was what my government did in 1939, which was to try to persuade the Bulgarian uh, and, and Romanian authorities not to allow the boat to travel further towards the Black Sea because they didn't want the Jews to reach Palestine. And they tried several times to interdict the ship and eventually, as the film shows, they just about failed. But they tried exactly the same thing in relation to the Roma seeking asylum to interdict them, uh, to stop them from reaching, in, in that case, from reaching my country. So I acted for the European Human Rights Center in the judicial review in English courts, challenging the legality of that policy, which we said was racially discriminatory. And we faced problems of proof. How do you prove that it was racist? So we relied on undercover observation uh, carried out by volunteers at the Park Airport and statistical evidence about what was happening on the ground. The British government, of course, denied that the policy was racially discriminatory, and they disputed the relevance and accuracy of our evidence. But the House of Lords, our supreme judicial authority at that time, decided that the policy was unlawful, and they ruled that racial discrimination is so invidious that it violates customary international law, as well as international human rights treaties. And their judgments explain what is stereotyping. And I should like to pay tribute to the government lawyers in that case, who voluntarily disclosed documents to me showing how the training of immigration officers had involved racial stereotypes. Without <coughs> that, I doubt I would have won the case. So that is an admirable quality when your opponents act honorably in that way. Another example of how it's happened problem of proof arose in what um, Renato has already told you about, the East African Asian case against the UK before the European Commission of Human Rights. And I want to say a bit more about that. Because what happened was that after gaining independence uh, in the 1960s, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania introduced racially motivated policies of Africanization. They preferred their own African citizens in trade and employment, and they expelled those who were not local citizens, uh, mainly British citizens of Asian descent. And those British Asians had kept their British citizenship because the British government had promised them that they would keep their right to come to the UK if they needed it. As the screw tightened in Africa, they began to come to the UK seeking refuge in their only country of citizenship. There was a populist campaign, and the government introduced emergency legislation to abolish their right to come and live in the UK. It was driven through all its parliamentary stages in three terrible days and nights in March 1968. On its face, the act was neutral. Uh, it didn't say anything about race. But its real purpose and effect was racially motivated to deprive the British Asians of their right of entry because they were brown. And so what happened was that they were deprived of their livelihood and their possessions in East Africa, divided from members of their families in the UK, detained for weeks or months in prison if they tried to enter the UK, shuttled here and there across Europe, Africa, Asia, desperately seeking a new world, some stranded in Europe en route for the UK, others stranded in India. Nominally, they remained citizens of the UK, but, but they became citizens without status, in fact, if not in law. So the only recourse open to them, because our parliament is sovereign, was to complain to the European Commission of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And so I found myself representing a British Asian couple in a test case 
involving some 200,000 excluded British Asians. And we had two major difficulties, which any of you who are going to litigate will find in your working practices. The first was proof. How do you prove that a law which is facially neutral is discriminatory uh, in intent and effect? And secondly, what do you do about the fact that the European Convention is so narrow in the way that it tackles discrimination? So to solve the first problem, and that will really interest more, I think, practitioners than scholars, but to solve the first problem, that's to say proving that a law that is facially neutral is in fact racially discriminatory, we put forward a strong body of evidence, press reports, statistics, political history, including a letter from a former conservative minister admitting that a pledge had been given to the British Asians. The second problem, the legal problem, was because the prohibition of discrimination in Article 14 of the Convention is very narrow and only applies to discrimination in other rights. Uh, what even your director doesn't know it is how it came about that we solved that problem. And I shall tell you the story because it's against myself. And it has a certain moral. I, I took with me to Strasbourg uh, a wonderful American constitutional law professor from Texas, Charles Black, who was a Yale law professor. I can't imitate his voice, unfortunately. But just before the hearing, he said to me when I told him what the case was about, he said, I think I've got the neck of the chicken. <laughs> and I said, really? <laughs> uh, I, I had a half an hour to go before I asked him. <coughs> he said, you have to argue that in and of itself, race discrimination is inherently degrading. And I said, look, Charles, this is a European Commission. Uh, uh, this is far too radical. And he said, do they have American Supreme Court judgments in the building? And I said, yes. He said, I just wanted to take you to the library and show you two cases. And I was in a very bad mood because I was nervous and so on. But I said, all right, Charles. So we went to the library and he showed me two cases. Um, one was called Stouder of Stouder in West Virginia, and the other was called Trevor of Dulles. And I said, look, Charles, there is no way that these European commissioners are ever going to be interested in American constitutional case law. But, I said, because you're a friend, I shall mention it. <laughs> so I mentioned it, and we won on that basis. <laughs> we won on his basis, which I had thought too radical. And that shows something both about me and about being courageous in the way that you argue cases. Because sometimes who dares wins. And that was a wonderful occasion when I won, not because of my own brains, but because of those of a great American law professor. And you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was that we won. And effectively, the Commission found the United Kingdom guilty of bad faith and the United Kingdom Parliament guilty of bad faith, but they had both been racist but pretended that they were not racist. And the government uh, was so embarrassed by the finding that for years they refused to allow the judgment, the, the opinion of the Commission, even to be published. It took years before it was properly published. Meanwhile, my own secretary, Roy Jenkins, did implement the, the, the judgment, and the East African Asians got in um, instead of 30 years, within five years. And I'm glad to say that two, de two decades later, in Cyprus and Turkey, the court itself approved the reasoning in the East African Asians case and applied it to another vulnerable group of Greek Cypriots living in the enclaved area of northern Cyprus. So I now turn to the landmark case of D.H. Nuttles against the Czech Republic. Uh, and that case began its life here in Budapest, 
when I was chairing the European Human Rights Centre and Jim Goldstone was legal director and now of course is the executive director uh, of OSI. And Jim and I decided that it was important to do more than challenge the endless stream of cases involving police and gang violence against Roma. And we decided to choose to tackle instead the problem in the Czech Republic and elsewhere of inferior school education. And I suppose at the back of our minds, we knew all about racially segregated education in the States and the great case of Brown and the Board of Education in 1958. And so, sitting in Budapest, we identified a group of Roman parents in a deprived part of Ostrava, whose children had been put in special schools meant for those of low intelligence and ability. The parents had all signed consent forms, but they regretted what they'd done, and they wanted their children to be educated in normal schools. Before we could take their case to Strasbourg, we had to exhaust domestic remedies, working with Czech lawyers, even though we realized that that would be an exercise in futility. The parents were under constant pressure not to pursue their case. They needed constant victim support, and they didn't always get it. And they persisted, and the case came before a chamber of the court, and Jim Goldstone and I had the privilege of acting as co-counsel together with the Czech lawyer. And the chamber found no violation. But Judge Costa, later president of the court, said that he was concerned that the issue needed the attention of the Grand Chamber. I think I was the only one who said, let's go to the Grand Chamber. The rest all thought it was a complete waste of time. But George Soros backed us personally, and we went to the Grand Chamber, and a majority of the Grand Chamber found that there had been racial discrimination in the enjoyment of the right to education. What is more, they looked at the case law in Luxembourg about women's rights, which was much stronger than anything in Strasbourg, uh, and they <coughs> blessed it for use in Strasbourg. So two courts came together. They also recognized difficulties about burden of proof, the need for <coughs> shifting burden of proof, the use of statistical evidence, and they decided it was unfair to treat these vulnerable people as having waived their conventional rights by signing the consent forms. Uh, and they rejected the government's policy, but the policy was not discriminatory. Uh, Judge Subanchit, I'm sorry to mispronounce, from Slovenia, uh, Jungwirth from the Czech Republic, Borrego Borrego from Spain and Sikuta from Slovakia dissented. And the terms in which they expressed their dissent are revealing. The judge Supanchik described it as bordering on the absurd to find the Czech Republic in violation of anti discrimination principles, and he concluded in this way No amount of politically charged argumentation can hide the obvious fact that the court in this case has been brought into play for ulterior purposes which have little to do with the special education of Roma children in the Czech Republic. The future will show what specific purpose this president will serve. And then Judge Jungwirth from the Czech Republic disputed the factual findings and Judge Borrego Borrego from Spain said the Grand Chamber has in this judgment behaved like a Formula One in doing so, has inevitably strayed far from the line normally followed by the court. And when at one point I tried to mention Brown of the Board of Education, I think it was he who interrupted saying he wanted nothing to do with American jurisprudence. <laughs> the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe supervised the execution of the court's final judgment uh, as part of its role. And one increasing technique they have 
is to ask for an action plan from the respondent state to evaluate what they're doing to implement. And the Czech Republic has submitted two action plans in the last six years uh, since the, the court gave judgment. But the, the committee is still not satisfied that they've done enough and are continuing to press for concrete results. And that, in my view, is that one. Then in a more recent case against Hungary, similar to the Czech case, Horvath and case against Hungary, the court unanimously decided, again, that the convention had been violated here because of the absence of effective safeguards against the misdiagnosis and displacement of two Roma children in schools meant for children with mental difficulties. And it noted that the misplacement of Roma children in special schools has a long history across Europe. And it referred to the state's positive obligation to overcome the effect of past race discrimination in schools and discriminatory practices disguised in neutral terms. And it concluded that the relevant Hungarian legislation and gliding practice had a disproportionately prejudicial effect on the Roma community, and that the situation, in a situation of private racial discrimination, that the state had failed to prove the guarantees needed to protect this particularly vulnerable group. The Hungarian government has recently provided a brief action plan to the Committee of Ministers, on government, only two pages long, on government measures to abide by the court's judgment. And in early December, the Committee of Ministers in Strasbourg will scrutinize the plan and are likely to call for further information. And I hope that Roman organizations will make their views known to the Committee of Ministers. I'm not expert, of course, in Hungarian laws or practices, and I hope that what I've said about Hungary is fair and accurate. The Hungarian constitution guarantees racial equality, and the race directive has been given effect in Hungary in domestic legislation. But like other European states, Hungary faces increasing levels of xenophobia, incitement, and racism. Human rights NGOs consistently report that Roma in Hungary are discriminated against in almost all fields of life, especially employment, education, housing, health care, and access to public places. When the UN Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism visited Hungary in 2011, all government officials and civil society representatives <coughs> in Eastburg agreed that the situation is getting worse. The rate of employment, unemployment among the Roma is estimated at 70%, 10 times higher than the national average. Fewer than 25% of Roma children complete general or vocational second level school, compared with over 60% of non-Roma. Between 45 and 55% of Roma live in segregated environments. 44% of Roma households lack one or more of the following, an indoor kitchen, indoor toilet, indoor shower, or bath, or electricity, compared with 16% of non-Roma. There are important issues in Hungary and elsewhere about the gathering and use of ethnic data, as I've said, unrelated to identifiable individuals to tackle race discrimination. Historically, the recording of characteristics such as ethnicity, race, and religion, especially against Jews by the Nazis, had negative and sometimes fatal consequences for individuals, particularly those under totalitarian regimes. It is understandable that many Roman families are reluctant to volunteer their ethnicity when asked by officials. It's not so long ago that Nazis used official data to identify the location of public Roma and Jews for deportation to the death camps. Today, experiences of discrimination, segregation, and ethnically motivated violence explain Roma reluctance to place their faith in the state and its agents and identify their ethnicity when asked. The fear of administrative misuse, restrictions on their freedom of movement and expulsion have to be overcome if statistics on ethnicity are to be accurate and effective. The practice of collecting data on, based on ethnicity differs from country to country throughout Europe and often depends on the cultural suitability and sensitivity of asking questions relating to ethnicity. Many European governments remain reluctant 
to collect ethnic data and justify their stance by referring to data protection and respect for personal privacy. But the EU Commission has repeatedly explained the essential role played by statistics in enabling anti-discrimination policies and increasing the capacity of member states to ensure social cohesion and promote equality and diversity. The scarcity of ethnic data in most member states and the reluctant attitude towards sensitive data collection in the mistaken belief that this would breach EU law led the EU Commission to make clear in 2006 that this was not the case. And I've quoted in my lecture exactly what they've said. The protection in Article 8 of the Convention to Personal Privacy doesn't create any obstacle either. Uh, and uh, ever since the early 1990s in the UK, we've been collecting impersonal data of crucial importance. In 2005, Hungary promised as part of the Roma Decade of Inclusion that it would work towards eliminating discrimination and closing the gaps between Roma and the rest of society. In the opening lines of the, that decade declaration, the member states undertook to measure outcomes and demonstrate progress in implementing the decade action plan. Implicit in any promise to measure outcomes is the need for benchmarks, and that requires necessarily data collection. It's my understanding that data collection, data protection legislation in Hungary does not prevent the collection of anonymous ethnic data to monitor progress in combating discrimination. The law has been misinterpreted to prevent ethnic data gathering. And there is, in my view, a pressing need for change in thinking, in practice, to encourage the collection of data on ethnicity to combat discrimination and promote racial equality. Although some ethnic data collection currently takes place in public education, public works and employment, it, need, it is needed in health and housing and public services on the basis that it will be anonymous. So the resurgence of extremist political parties in Hungary, encouraging racial discrimination and inciting racial violence, coupled with openly anti-Roman statements and hate speech in the media, also needs to be urgently addressed including measures to deal with extremist paramilitary organizations targeting Roma. In July, the Strasbourg Court upheld a decision of the Supreme Court of Hungary allowing the dissolution of the Hungarian Guard, which organized a number of anti-Roman rallies. They are a paramilitary group whose members wore black uniforms, evoking the Arab Cross, Hungary's wartime, uh, fascist party. Uh, and I've quoted in here the important statement of principle uh, by that court. Apart from legislative and administrative reforms, what are needed are firm and courageous political leadership and voluntary action by the media, the public services, employers, trade unions, teachers, students to translate the ideals of equality into practice. Now, that applies as much to my country and the Western part of Europe as yours. Rut Rutko Korsinski, president of the European Roman Travels Forum, was reported last week to have said that Roma from Romania and Bulgaria are coming to the West after years in which the EU has <coughs> democracy and free labor markets. He said they're not leaving because they're poor, but because they're forced to depart. And he rightly criticized the sense of panic in the West, including my country. Moshe Cantor, president of the European Jewish Congress said, the fact that a quarter of Jews are not able to express their Jewishness because of fear should be a watershed moment for the continent of Europe and the European Union. The Jewish reality in Europe is a great concern and the authorities need to deal with incidents of hate and intolerance in a holistic manner to really combat these manifestations before it is too late. 
He said the rise of extremism means that democracy has to protect itself. And this is not just a problem for Jews, but a problem for all Europeans. And the identity and spirit of the European Union depends on taking these steps. These are timely reminders that the problems of racism are not confined to any one country, and that their solution requires urgent, common, and effective action to combat prejudice and the discrimination in which it takes shape. I hope what I said may be useful in advancing much needed action here and abroad. We thank you for your patience. being addressed, but I nevertheless would like to take you back to the UK, if you don't mind. And uh, you mentioned that you have a new <coughs> Equality Act, which is enforced since 2010. And uh, I would like to ask you about what this has brought in terms of protecting, protecting race discrimination, especially since it has moved the UK equality thinking from a separate, like very pillared system, which protected race and gender and disability separately to one which is integrated. And it's known that the race lobby was one of the most vocal lobbies in, in uh, opposing this law. And so it would be interesting to know, do you think this has brought better protection to race? And if it did, in which ways? And do you think maybe it has decreased some of the parts of the protection that race has had before? So I would like to reflect on that. Thank you. <coughs> Of um, Well, um, the, the, first, the first really effective race discrimination legislation was in 1976. Uh, and uh, it was that I helped to design it, uh, and it was pretty good. Uh, it was then strengthened by as a result of a racist lynching of a black person, Stephen Lawrence, it was extended to the police and to indirect uh, discrimination in an important way for all public services. If you go back to what prison was like in the early 60s, um, there was blatant race discrimination. Uh, you could go looking for a house in London, and it was saying that very British way, sorry, no blacks. I like the word sorry always. <laughs> uh, you could go into a public house, as I did, with a black friend, and you'd be thrown out. Uh, and uh, if you wanted council housing and you were black in some areas of London, you wouldn't get any council housing because the local council had a club. Now, all of those overt examples of race discrimination um, had been, the overt problem had been eliminated uh, before the Equality Act 2010. Um, the Commission for Racial Equality, which was the equality agency we set up, had, however, been rather ineffective in using law in test cases, or encountering patterns and practices of race discrimination. The Women's Rights Organization, the EOC, the Equal Opportunities Commission, was actually much more effective. But the EOC was largely white women. And the CRE was not largely white women. And there were complicated conflicts between black men 
to found white, the, the, the association of white women for grading and white women to found the association with black men for grading. When I worked with Roy Jenkins, I made the mistake in a speech to a feminist society called the Fawcett Society of using race statistics to demonstrate the problems of women. And the civil servant said, be careful. The women will be furious. And I said, rubbish. And they were furious. So there were always important, under the surface, political tensions. Whereas in America, the feminist movement and the anti-slavery movement and the civil rights movement came together, in Britain there was never that common uh, battle fought by women and, and black people. When it was decided to, there's a very long answer but still, when it was decided to bring together disability, which had been separate, uh, um, gender, which had been separate, race, which had been separate, to add uh, religion, which had been separate, to add age, which had been separate as well, when it was decided to bring it all together, um, the CRE, the race body, said we don't want to be part of that. And sorry to say that part of their rhetoric was, I'm afraid, you know, what do these white women really know about our problem? There was a great deal under cover. And in the end, a lot of politics was played, and the chairman of the CRE became chairman of the Equality and Human Rights Commission in order to try to paper over these differences. So the real answer to your question is I don't think the 2010 Act has made much difference because most of the overt problems um, have been tackled well before. But if you say, okay, but what about problems that remain? I would say the challenges for the new Equality and Human Rights Commission, which has not done very well since 2010, the challenges for them to use their powers properly in order to tackle not only race discriminatory practices, but others as well. And they have not yet succeeded in doing that. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> I'm Peter Monard from the Center for Media Communication Studies and here at CV. Yes. So, and and I would like to ask you about the connection between the prejudices and expression of prejudices and the discrimination it takes shape in, as you mentioned. So how do you see, I wonder how do you see what is the best combination of regulating against discrimination and also regulating so-called hate speech or incitement to hatred? Because it seems that often what happens that that rather so-called hate speech is regulated based on its content and instead of effective working anti-discrimination law and also it seems and there I finish the question that that in environments where we deal with uh, police, prosecutors, courts, other people responsible for the application of the law, like people at the Equal Treatment Authority, often those people are also on their prejudices. And it seems to me that if we go with the sort of what can be considered as the mainstream European approach, a content-based uh, prohibition of so-called hate speech, which is kind of subjective, what is that, then prejudiced uh, prosecutors, police, and courts might apply it in abusive ways. As if, as, and if we go with the, what is the American and to some extent Hungarian approach, say we prohibit only incitement to hatred when it creates imminent danger, there seems to be less chance for an arbitrary interpretation of that danger test. Well, well, um, Um, uh, but one of the things you said, which is not the main question, which I think is important, is you said equality agencies may themselves be prejudiced. And that's true. 
there's always a danger uh, that, for example, um, an, an agency dealing with sex discrimination might might say, we don't want to take up a case with a middle class woman. Uh, we only want to take it up for a working class woman. Um, so we won't, I mean, there's, a, there's a great, always great scope for subjective um, judgments of that kind. But that's not the core of your question. The core of your question, I think, is what do I think about hate speech and criminalizing hate speech? Um, I have all, uh, British Jews, uh, British and European Jewish organizations, uh, as you know probably, have always been pressing very strongly for anti-race hate speech legislation. Ever since I can remember that has been so. It began in Britain in the early 60s with the Nazi party demonstrations in other places. And in 1965, the first race hate laws passed in Britain uh, dealing with deliberately stirring up racial hatred. What is the problem about even that kind of law? In my experience, the problem is that whether you win or you lose, you don't really tackle the underlying problem. If you prosecute and convict uh, a preacher of race hatred and, and send him to prison, he becomes a master <coughs> of free speech. If, on the other hand, you prosecute and you lose, uh, uh, then the race hate organization can say, this is what they tried to ban, and they fail, and then they can give more weight to the racist utterance. So it's quite difficult in practice, not in theory, but in practice, it's quite difficult to demonstrate that race hate laws accomplish what people want them to. And so I tend to not more towards the United States on this than I do towards Europe. On the other hand, my good friend Roger Herrera, who has been a professor here and a great judge in France, he says on the other side, and he's Jewish too, he says uh, it's all very well for the Americans, but the Europeans who lived under Nazi occupation have a different kind of pessimistic experience, and so he takes the other point of view. In the context of uh, so, so, so in Britain, we have a relatively strong uh, criminalization of race speech. In my view, too strong, because we criminalize not only um, deliberate race speech that stirs up hatred, but also that is, whether it's intended or not, likely to stir up hatred. And I think that's too strong. The danger of of, of such a law is that then religious groups come along and they say, well, um, Jews are a race. They're protected as a race, as well as being a religion. We are Muslims. We are a religion. We're not protected. So now can you please have a blasphemy law or a religious hate law that will protect the prophet or our religion against insults? But that then brings in more serious problems about freedom of expression. Then, as I was saying before to a colleague, you get in, you say, homophobic hate speech. Is, is homophobic hate speech more like race hate speech or more like religious hate speech? Is, is it because of your common humanity, what you're born with, or is it your practices? And if you look at... Uh, recent judgments in Strasbourg, some of the thoughtful younger judges, including the very bright German judge, Angelica Nussbaum, are saying, we need to think again about how to approach race hate. I completely understand, if I were German, why there might be a Holocaust denial law for historical reasons. And it's not really my affair to comment on that. But in general, the answer to your question is that I do not believe a criminalizing hate speech 
is a smart way of, of combating prejudice. I tend to the American position, which is that the best remedy for evil speech is more speech and not less speech. But that is an optimistic view about the Europeans. <coughs> and the, neg the other view would be, well, look what happened with the Nazis. Have I answered your question? Oh, and, and I mean, the test, you're right. Uh, if you adopt the American position, it has to be stirring up violence or an imminent threat, threat of violence. And that is much more certain than a kind of likelihood of hatred against people, which is very vague. So the American <coughs> position has the advantage of being narrower and clearer. On the other hand, I, I wouldn't say everything about free speech in America is something I would recommend. <laughs> for your uh, lecture. I have um, a question about proving discrimination and proving indirect discrimination. And you were mentioning in your talk. Um, I would start with uh, uh, actually uh, domestic violence cases of European Court of Human Rights. I know that the speech about race <laughs> discrimination, but I will return to it. Um, so European Court of Human Rights already ha have a couple of outstanding cases on domestic violence. And they started first with the Turkish case of Booz versus Turkey, where, where there was a uh, really strong, um, uh, strong um, <coughs> statistical data proving the case. And uh, then what there was- case? What was the case? Uh, Opus versus Turkey. I don't know no, if I, mean, I pronounce. I mean, what kind of problem? Ah, so it was a domestic violence uh, uh, case. So there was a, a violent uh, uh, husband who was uh, constantly uh, abusing a wife and her uh, uh, and her mother. Uh, ab abuses uh, included stabbing with a knife. Uh, ap apart from just threatening with uh, with a, with a death, it was. Standing with a knife, um, and Turkey, driving a car. And the Turkish law wasn't strong enough. Uh, it, it, the, the, it wasn't because uh, the, the, uh, uh, this husband was arrested for a couple of times. It, it was criminally prosecuted by. But in a way, these sanctions were not really harsh, and uh, Tur Turkish uh, uh, enforcement uh, wasn't really persistent with. Uh, uh, with addressing the, uh, uh, the issue of domestic violence. Um, uh, then we had this Croatian case where Croatian lawyers uh, arguing for uh, applicant submitted some statistical data, but the court found that it wasn't enough to prove uh, the domestic violence case, which is indirect discrimination. But then there is a, a recent uh, uh, Moldovan case which was argued, by the way, by the fo uh, former uh, inter-rights lawyer. Uh, and uh, it seems that the court didn't really ask for statistical data. There was a, a report from a UN special reporter saying that this particular problem, the problem of domestic violence is a problem which is widely spread in, um, in, in Moldova. And it, was, it seems that it was enough to prove the case, apart from you know the real uh, uh, non-effective uh, 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 actions from the state authorities to tackle the problem, so my uh, my question is: Do you think that this lessening of uh, uh, burden of proof in in indirect dis uh, discrimination cases, as shown uh, in in domestic violence uh, cases, do you think that it is the answer? to the question, or do you think that it might have some, I don't know, uh, 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 not really positive effect uh, in terms of, I don't know, in terms of uh, how we perceive legal issues, for example? Well, in law, as everywhere else, context is everything. And if you're talking about proving in a civil case race discrimination in schools, that is not at all the same kind of case as a way of saying that the criminal justice uh, is not sufficiently effective 
to deter or punish domestic violence. Um, so you can't read across stuff about civil standard of proof to the other context. In the other, we, we've had the problem uh, in Britain in the other context when we tried to make it easier to prove rape cases. And, and uh, some years ago, um, our Supreme Court, that was then the House of Lords, decided um, that what the government had introduced and Parliament had done was not fair to the defendant because it put too light a, uh, a burden on the prosecution and therefore there'd be no fair trial. Now, I don't know enough about uh, these cases to know, but, I, but it's, a, it's a different kind of problem as to what an international court should say to a state about what it should do in its criminal legal system to deter and punish domestic violence. There is now a, a new European Convention on domestic violence, uh, and that is causing me a lot of problems. <coughs> Why? Because, and this shows a kind of problem of context. The, the new European Convention on Domestic Violence says forced marriages must be made criminal. Now, I spend a lot of my time making the forcing of someone to marry against their will a civil wrong civil wrong to be dealt with in private in a family <coughs> so that the young girl will still be able to be with her family. Her family will not be dishonored. Right now, this week, yesterday, my Prime Minister in my country says we cannot sign up to the European Domestic Violence Convention unless we make forced marriage criminal. Okay. So, at first sight, it sounds wonderful, doesn't it? We are going to be tough on that form of appalling violence. A young girl of 12, 14, goes off to India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. She meets a man. She's forced to marry the man in folk against her will, or he rapes her, etc. But the disastrous thing about making it criminal, if you're not careful, is that the civil victims will not come forward because they don't want to have the police criminal burden of proof, a public criminal trial, and to see their family dishonored in that way. So this week, well, instead of being here, I should have been in my parliament arguing yesterday as to why the government is making a mistake. And I only give that example because you know when it's criminal, when it's not criminal, how you tackle it is the subject of next year's lecture. <laughs> thank you very much. I would like to thank all the members of the audience for participating. Because there's still some more speakers. And then I'm going to free speech. <laughs> and if you wish to go on trying to make sure that certain people don't get terribly tired <laughs> and terribly exhausted. Right. So, uh, That's would right. you, would you <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea was. The idea was that I thank all of you for coming, especially the students who had an extremely long day today. They had a very long day yesterday and were exemplary in attending our lectures. I would also like to thank both the Golden Society Foundations for having had supported the lecture series for, for nine years of its, its running. In particular, I would like to thank Marga Adamovic for being the chaperone for myself. And uh, Tilesh, who has done an excellent job on the legal studies side for, for quite a few years. Uh, I'm very <coughs> absolutely sure that Professor Oshetinsky gave a very nice closing to the lecture series in Warsaw, because there is still, this was the first part of this year. Can they go to and in order to, to make sure that we all leave, leave the room with, with nice memories, I would like to invite you to a reception where you can ask all your questions, which remain in you from, from what I said with the Thank you.